Bibles there. Let's turn over to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we began an introduction to the book of Colossians. So we're going to take the next few verses as we work our way through. Uh, but as we looked at last time, looked at Paul wrote this book to the church there at Colossae, not a very uh, famous place. In fact, maybe 20 years after he wrote this, uh, the entire city was wiped off the face of the map uh, and was completely destroyed. Uh, so these weren't famous people. This wasn't a church that Paul started. Uh, but a man named Epaphras came asking Paul for some help. Uh, does anyone remember what false doctrine was going through, what they were struggling through in the church there at Colossae? I know it was a little while ago. <clears throat> Struggled a little bit with the deity of Christ. And so here in this book, as we read through, there's a lot there that Paul has to say about the person of Jesus Christ. But before we get there, he encouraged them in the faith that they had, that they had acknowledged the grace of God in truth. And he rejoiced with them in their salvation. And then we move through to where we're going to begin today, in verse number 9. And we're going to read through to verse number 13. So if you've got that, let's be upstanding. We'll read these few verses and then we'll begin. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through to 13. <clears throat> And it reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. We'll leave it there. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. I do pray that this morning you would help us by your spirit, and that we would be encouraged and challenged through your word. Lord, I pray that uh, the message would be clear. I pray that you would be exalted in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, you may be seated. So Paul begins by praying for this group of believers. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Now he's here dealing with uh, a, a problem, a problem of not understanding properly who... Uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, well, they did understand for salvation, but there were people there in that time who had been uh, promoting another, uh, another Christ, another gospel, uh, some different things, and it was causing a lot of confusion here. And rather than get straight to the point and say, this is what they're teaching, it's wrong, this is why it's wrong, he does that later. But he begins with an earnest prayer for spiritual growth. And you know, there's a lot of things that try and uh, get our mind get our brain, get us to move away from the Word of God. There are a lot of different doctrines, different ideas, different uh, bits and pieces of men's wisdom that try and uh, grab a piece of our mind. And they need to be dealt with. But you know, there's one thing that can help above all, and Paul understood it here, it was first and foremost, if you can just grow and walk with the Lord... That's going to help a lot of our problems. And so before ever he got to dealing with the facts of the issue, he says, you know what? It's last time we looked at it, it's wonderful that you guys are saved. You've received the grace of God in truth. Now I want you to grow in that. And you know what? As we just stick to the word of God and as we endeavor to grow and walk with the Lord, a lot of those things uh, seem to, to fall away. But he begins there in verse number nine for this cause, for this cause. What was it? In verse number 6, he speaks of the gospel that <clears throat> came unto them and brought forth fruit 
in them since the day they heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So he's acknowledged that they've understood the gospel, they've come to the Lord in salvation and the grace of God is at work in their hearts and it's bringing forth fruit. And he says, that's a wonderful thing. And you know what? When I heard that you guys got saved and when I heard that the Holy Spirit of God was working in you, what I wanted to do is I wanted to pray that you would go beyond that. Because you know, salvation is a wonderful starting point But there's a lot that we need to do beyond that, isn't there? And I think we all know that. So he says, for this cause, since the day we heard of it, what is it that he prays for them? What is it that he prays for them? Well, you may have heard a old proverb, many hundreds of years old, that is early to bed, early to rise, makes one healthy, wealthy, and wise. Early to bed, early to rise makes one healthy, wealthy, and wise. And that's been uh, something that a lot of people would endeavour Uh, to get in their life. They want good health, they want wealth, and they want wisdom. And much of the world is centered around trying to attain those three things. And it's not bad to be healthy, it's not bad to be wealthy, and it's not bad to be wise. But you know, if that's all you've got going for you in this world, it's a pretty empty endeavor, isn't it? Because our health can be stripped from us very quickly. Our wealth can fail very quickly. Even our wisdom doesn't always stand up to everything that's out there. Yet Paul here prays for them that they would be healthy, wealthy and wise, but not in a secular sense as we might understand it, but in a spiritual sense. And we're going to look through that this morning as he talks about uh, wisdom that they need to learn. They need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. They need to increase in the knowledge of God. He prays for wisdom. He prays that they would be healthy, that is, that they would be fruitful in every good work. You know, a healthy tree, a healthy plant is one that's bringing forth fruit as it should. So he prays that they might be healthy, that they might be wise. And he encourages them that they are partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He reminds them of their wealth. And so before he starts to deal with these matters of doctrine that are being challenged... He encourages them in their spiritual growth. He says, as believers, I want you to be spiritually healthy, wealthy, and wise. And so the first thing he challenges them there in verse number nine is that you ought to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Hey, it's wonderful that you've been saved. That's not enough. Now I want you to go on and do what God has for you. And as we've been going through uh, discipleship with some of the young adults, we looked at uh, understanding God's will for your life. And that's a very important thing for every believer to understand God's will for their life. How do I understand God's will for my life? Well, as we read through the Word of God, the Bible says it's definitely God's will for you to be saved. It's definitely God's will for you to be sanctified. It's definitely God's will for you to be thankful. It's God's will for you to be serving Him, to be walking with Him. There's many things that are very clear in the Word of God that are His will. And He says, you know what I want you to do, you young believers who are struggling a little bit? I want you to move on from the joy of your salvation and I want you to start endeavouring to understand what is it that God wants for me to do. He goes, you're being distracted with so many other things. And what I just want you to knuckle back to is, what does God have for my life? How do I find out what God wants for my life? We get stuck into the Word of God. How is it that God teaches us what it is that He has for us? Because we understand that there's a general will of God that is the same will for you and for me. It's God's will for both of us to be saved. It's God's will for both of us to be sanctified. But then there are some things that it's God's will for you to do that it's not God's will for me to do. And it's God's will for me to do and it's not God's will for you to do. And how do I know those ones that aren't written very specifically in the Word of God? And that's why he says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Hey, how do I attain wisdom and spiritual understanding? That comes by the Spirit of God through His Word. In John chapter 14, verse 26, the Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. You know, we have within us one who will help us and teach us all things. John chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. 
For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Bible says that we have one who will teach us all things. We have one who will lead us into all truth. That's the Holy Spirit of God within us. Hey, how do I get spiritual understanding? Well, it comes through reading the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach me. And so what he's saying is, don't be distracted by other things. I want you to understand what the will of God is. And the only way that I can do that is forget what everyone else is saying. Get stuck into the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. We get so distracted, don't we? And he wants to bring them back to the word of God. He goes, you did know the grace of God in truth. You allowed the gospel to take root in your life and bring forth fruit. Continue to let it do that. You don't need to remove yourself from that. Salvation is not this one thing that we start on and then we go away and endeavor service and other things. No, continue in the same thing that, you, that got you saved in the first place. Be filled with the knowledge of His will. Through wisdom and spiritual understanding that comes through the Word of God, comes through the Spirit of God. That word there, be filled, uh, it means to be full up, fully equipped, have full understanding. That means that this is something that I'm going to need to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing as I continue to build an understanding of what does God want for me. Because I'm going to learn and learn and spend time with the Word of God and I'm going to learn the next step. And then I need to keep learning and keep studying and keep allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in me so I know the next step. And then I need to keep learning and keep learning and keep learning so I know the next step. And this is something that's going to go for the rest of our lives as we endeavor to allow the Holy Spirit of God to give us spiritual understanding so that we can be fully equipped with the knowledge of God's will. Because we want to be ready to go. He's speaking to a lot of young believers here. We're ready to go. Where do I go? What do I do? We want to be fully equipped. It's not good just to have passion. We need purpose and plan. And the Lord gives us that and wants to give us that, but we need to, to attain that by spiritual understanding, which can only come through spending time in the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us, to mold us, to equip us for something. That's what it means to be filled. Not only that, it also means to be controlled. When the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit, it means that I am allowing Him to control me, guide my steps, guide my path. And so when Paul says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, that is, I don't want you just to know it. I want you to do it. You know, biblical wisdom is always practical. It's never just a head knowledge. It always ought to filter through into something practical. And so what he's saying here is spend some time in the Word of God. If you do that, he goes, I promise you, the Spirit of God will teach you. Because that's what he is. He's our teacher. And if you're seeking for truth, I promise you that you'll find it because we have the one who'll lead us into all truth. And so if you do those things, God will reveal his will to you. And he says, when God reveals his will to you, allow it to control you. Allow it to guide you. That's what it means to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Be filled with the knowledge of His will. In verse number 10, so his first, his first thing is, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. I want you to be wise. I want you to be wise. Not the world's wisdom. Not do what I think I know to do. No, no, no. Do what God wants you to do. Live the way God wants you to live. Go where God wants you to go. And verse number 10 begins with a word, that, that. There's a purpose to this. There's a purpose to knowing God's will. There's a purpose to being filled with this particular type of wisdom. Because it, it needs to work out of us. It is that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. This knowledge has practical application and it always does. Doctrine, anything we learn out of the Word of God, always has practical application. It's never just a dead knowledge. It's never just things to know. As we grow and increase in our knowledge of God and His Word, it always ought to practically be applied in our life. 
He says, I want you to walk worthy of the Lord. That is, that word there, walk, is to conduct your life. The whole way that we live our life, he goes, I want it to be worthy of the Lord. The word there, worthy, means appropriately. It means after a godly sort. It means when someone considers the way that you are conducting your whole life, they will look at that and they'll say, that pertains to God. Uh, that is something that, uh, that looks like God. That is a godly sort of living, a godly sort of walking. And he says that this is an appropriate way to walk. We ought to walk worthy of the Lord. And so we consider, what is it that the Lord has done for us? Philippians chapter 2 explains uh, in detail of how he left the glory of heaven to come to earth. And he didn't come as its king at first. He came as a servant. The humility there. And he humbled himself. He became a man, became a servant. And then he tasted death, even the death of the cross. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And he says, I want you to consider these things that I know you know. And I want you to be studying the Word of God and getting in the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you so that as you're being taught of the Spirit of God, it's going to cause you to be able to walk in a way that is appropriate for a Christian. You're going to be able to walk in a way that is fitting of one who has been saved, of one who is no longer living in the world and pleasing his flesh, but of one that's been redeemed. He says there's an appropriate way that we ought to walk. You know what? Sometimes we try to walk in a way that is fitting of Christians without first being filled with the knowledge of his will. It doesn't work that way. I can try. I can try to put on a little bit of a show. I can attempt to fix the outward appearance do the right things, say the right things. But if I'm not filled with the knowledge of God's will that only comes through a working of the Spirit by His Word, I won't walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And that's what we want, isn't it? To walk in an appropriate way that pleases God. That's never going to come from my own efforts. That's only going to come as God works in me and shows me the way I ought to walk. Because what is the knowledge of God's will? It's the knowledge of how I ought to conduct my life. If I'm conducting my life outside of the will of God, I'm not walking worthy of the Lord, and I'm definitely not pleasing Him. It means I ought to walk in a way that I have a desire to please God however I can. That word there, pleasing, it's normally used in a, you could put it in a court setting, that word, uh, where you have the sort of the sniveling sycophant who just wants to, it, it's normally used in a bad tense, uh, where uh, this guy will do anything because he's just a big suck up. Uh, the smallest thing that the king wants, I'll do. Uh, no matter if it's big or small, I'll preempt your wishes. I'll have everything just right for you because I just want to please you and suck up to you because I might get something in return. And so Paul takes that word and he puts it in a positive sense. And he says, you know what, as a believer, the way that you conduct your life ought to be that your desire is in even the smallest thing or the greatest thing, I want to please God. Whatever his wish is, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to try and preempt what God wants me to do because I want to be there and I want to please him in every aspect and every area of my life. So he challenges them first, be filled. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. Gain some wisdom, gain some spiritual understanding. Why? So that I can conduct my life appropriately. So that I can walk worthy of the Lord. Then he moves on in verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work says, you know, if you go this way, it's going to make you healthy. It's going to cause you to bring forth fruit. You know, many of us try to bring forth fruit 
in our lives spiritually because we know it's necessary. We know that that's what God wants of us. God wants us to be fruitful Christians. And so we try to manufacture fruit. And what Paul is saying here is, no, first be filled with the knowledge of his will. Then you'll know how to conduct yourself. And then it just happens. You are being fruitful in every good work. He doesn't tell you to then bring forth fruit in every good work. He says that as you're conducting your life in a manner that's pleasing to God because you know His will, you are bringing forth fruit. And not just a bit here and a bit there. In every good work. Because it's God that's working in me and the Spirit of God that's working through me bringing forth fruit. It's here and it's there and it's there. It's there. It's at home and it's at church and it's at work. It's in this ministry and in this aspect. It's in this relationship and in that one. God is making me fruitful. And that ought to be what we desire. To be healthy, wealthy, wise, spiritually. The way I conduct my life affects my actions. It does. If I'm not walking in the will of God, I'm not bringing forth fruit. Because I'm not pleasing God. It's God that enables me to bring forth fruit. You know, sometimes we want to bring forth fruit, so we thrust ourselves into some form of service or ministry. That's not always good. It ought to be our walk with the Lord that influences us to serve, not just a, a desire, I have to bring forth fruit somewhere. There has to be some sort of evidence in my life so we manufacture it. Well, I'll go do this. I'll get involved in this. That's empty. If it didn't first come through a wisdom of God's will, a walking appropriately, that then leads to productive service. Ministry that pleases God. Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In doing this, I will be fruitful in every good work. And the last phrase there in verse number 10, and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's another byproduct of walking in a manner that is appropriate, that is fitting for a believer through the knowledge of his will. And that is that I will continue to increase. That word there means to develop or to grow, it's a very natural word. If we were not to increase, there would be a problem. If the child was not to grow, there would be a problem. If he was not to develop, there's a problem. And so he says here that as you are doing these things, you will begin to develop and your understanding of who God is will grow more and more. As I'm serving and walking in the will of God, I increase in the knowledge of God. What a wonderful thing. It begins with, Lord, would you teach me? That leads to the Spirit of God working in me and guiding me in my life. That leads to me conducting myself appropriately, fitting, walking in the will of God. Because I'm doing that, the Holy Spirit of God is bringing forth fruit in every aspect of my life. And because of that, Now I learn more about God, not just through his word, but this knowledge here is more of an experiential knowledge of I understand now how God is working in me a little bit more. I understand how the spirit of God is working in me. And I see now because now I'm involved in ministry that is the will of God. And I'm involved in a life that is walking in the will of God. And I'm seeing God work in my life in different ways. And I'm seeing God lead me. And I'm seeing God meet, uh, answer my prayers. And I'm seeing God uh, discipline me maybe. And I'm seeing God come through for me. And I'm, I'm learning all of these wonderful things. Why? Because I'm walking in the knowledge of his will. And he says, you know what? A wonderful byproduct of that is you'll increase much more in your knowledge of who God is. And it's a different kind of knowledge than just reading your Bible. That's very important. 
But as I read about who he is, now I've tasted of who he is. Doesn't David say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good? I can read about his goodness and that's encouraging. But when you taste it, how wonderful is that? David wrote a lot about the goodness of God. But you know, David, David knew a lot of extremes. He knew what it was like to be safe and to be king, to have everyone do what was necessary. He knew what it was like to win battles. He knew what it was like to be a man in authority and have everything that he wanted. He also knew what it was like to see family die. He knew what it was like to be on the run. He knew what it was like to lose. He knew what it was like to be beaten down, to be hated, to be oppressed. And yet David tasted of the goodness of God in those moments. And when he wrote it down, you can, you can almost hear the excitement in his voice as he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just take him at his word and you'll see. And that's what Paul is saying here. Would you just come to the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you? You're going to learn some things about God. And then go out there and put them, put them to the test. And you'll find that as you walk with God, you'll understand more about God. Because this has been proved in your life. I know by experience. We can read that God is the provider. But when God provides for us, it takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? There are times throughout Scripture where God reveals an essence of His character through His name. Maybe it was uh, Abraham who found that God provided a sacrifice and saved Isaac. And the Lord said, yeah, that's right. I am the God who provides. But Abraham already had to come to an understanding of that through experience. And then he grew and, and yeah, yeah, I can call him the provider because he is. And Abraham increased in the knowledge of God. And right throughout scripture, we see people who, they took God, they said, I know something about God, I'm going to put him to the test. And they increase in the knowledge of God. And I wonder in our lives, are we walking in the will of God, allowing the Spirit of God to work through us? Are you learning more about God? Are you developing? Are you growing? This is, not, this is not a surplus growth. This is the natural growth that we ought to have. This is the natural growth from infant to maturity. This is natural development. We need that, don't we? He says, I want you to increase. You know, this brings us to a full circle. Because now that I have increased in the knowledge of God a little bit more, I'm better able to walk in a way that's appropriately and, and pleasing to God. And when I do that, I am fruitful in every good work. And when I do that, I increase a little bit more in the knowledge of God, enabling me to be further fruitful, enabling me to increase more. And this is what he's saying. This is the natural stages of development that we ought to go through. He said, this is vital. Yeah, you've been saved. Now grow, be healthy, wealthy and wise. First be filled. We're filled so that we can walk. Our walk enables us to bear fruit. That enables us to increase or to grow. And then he says there in verse number 11, receive, receive. It's a wonderful plan, Paul. It's wonderful if it all works that way. But we actually live in the real world and bad things happen and I get busy and things don't always go the way I'd planned. And sometimes it's hard to spend time in the Word of God. And you know what, Paul, sometimes it's hard to work, walk in the Spirit. And you know what, sometimes there's just too many pressures to be able to devote the time that's necessary for that. And, and okay, Paul, but you don't know my family and, and Paul, you don't know my workplace. And Paul, you don't know my situation. 
And so he says, this isn't just all airy-fairy coming from your own endeavours. He says, receive. Verse number 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. It literally means empowered with all power. He goes, this isn't coming from your strength. This isn't something that you have to manufacture yourself. He goes, that's the whole point. The whole point is allowing God to do these things in and through us. That word there, power, is the word we get our word dynamite from. It's that explosive power. It's that might that God has that can do a lot of things. And if you've read through your Bible, it can do a whole lot of things. It's the power that created the world. It's the power that won all the battles. He says that's what God gives to us. He'll empower us with all power. He says it's according to His glorious power. His glorious power. We'll get back to that a little bit later. But what is it to? Unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. He goes, hey, I acknowledge that it's not always smooth sailing. He sets out for them the process of growth and development. And he says, I acknowledge that that's not always easy. Paul knew the, spiritual, the Christian life wasn't easy. Paul had been through a lot. Read through, he's been shipwrecked, he's been beaten, he's been whipped. He's been there when they've tried to pull him apart, literally. He had a cult of assassins make an oath. We're not going to eat till we kill you. He's, he's had everything. Definitely wasn't easy for Paul. And then through all of that, the Bible says that he had the care of all the churches and those pressures upon him. They weren't all just people trying to kill him. There was just the natural pressures of life. And then on top of that, he had to make tents to make his own living. And sometimes there'd be people like Mark who say, oh, can I come with you? Oh, all right, I've got to provide for you too. And that was, they, these were all burdens and pressures that Paul had. So he understood that it's not all easy. I'm not just saying this. I'm not just putting out the, the, the perfect uh, thing for you that I can't do or, or that I don't understand. So I acknowledge that. On top of that, Paul had uh, whatever it was that the Lord gave him that was a, a thorn in his flesh. Something that made it a little bit harder for him in the ministry. He had struggles too. But he said, there's something we can receive. And that is the strength, the power, and the might of God. Strengthened with all might. You know what? Everything that is necessary to accomplish this, God provides. Unto what? Patience and long-suffering with, with joyfulness. That word there, patience, that's hopeful endurance. That is... I'm going to push through this. That's, that's not I'm going to sit down and wait it out. That patience there is, is say, of someone who's in a race. Um, Mike has been getting me to, <clears throat> to do a couple of 5K runs. and I'm, We're getting there. We're getting there. But, wow. <laughs> so you get through, part, part way through it, and you're just like, Ugh, everything hurts, I'm out of breath, starting to get a stitch. But then you see the finish line. And patience here is that person who's under all of the pressure, all of the pain. He's running out of breath, but he knows that the finish line is ahead. And he knows that this is the whole purpose. This has been the purpose of the race has been to get to there. And he, he pushes on because of the hope that is there for him at the end. And so what uh, Paul is saying that we can not only just wait out our problems as we endeavor to walk with the Lord. We can actually endure, progress, develop and move forward walking worthy of the Lord, still being fruitful, still increasing in the knowledge of God because of the strength that God gives to us each day. And Paul knew what that was like. He said, though the outer man may perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day.
God there, by his power, enables us to hopeful endurance and to long-suffering. You know, the pressures of life don't have to hinder our walk with the Lord. Because we can receive the strength that God gives to us. And there it says that we're strengthened with all might according not just to his power, but to his glorious power. And when we think of the glorious power of God, we think of when God spoke the world into existence, that amazing, wonderful thing. Or we think about it when God himself fought for Israel. It just these, this wonderful display of the awesome power of God. And we think of... Uh, maybe the, uh, the Egyptians as they were coming after Israel as they were moving out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. And how God did wonderful, wonderful things for them. Opened up the Red Sea. Wow, that was the glorious power of God. Closed it back on the Egyptians there and saved the nation of Israel. And we think, wow, that is God's awesome, glorious power at work. And you know what Paul says? Yeah, that's true. But also, you know when God enables you to hopeful endurance? That's the awesome, glory, glorious power of God at work in your life. And we think, wow, that's something really special that God wants to do in me. And you know, if I receive all of that strength that God is enabling me, What for? Just to grow. Just to walk with the Lord. He says, you're a wonderful beacon of the glorious power of God. What a wonderful thing. So he says, be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Be wise. Walk worthy of the Lord. Be fruitful. Be healthy. Increase in the knowledge of God. In all of this, remember, it's not your strength. Receive the strength of God, the glorious power of God at work within you. And then one last thing here in verse number 12 and 13. Enjoy. It says, They're giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We talked about patience being hopeful endurance. What's the hope there that's at the end of the race? It's the wonderful inheritance that God has for those who are his children. He says, God has made you meet. In other words, he has enabled you to be able to enjoy it. Because you know, as an unsaved person, you don't qualify for that inheritance. But through salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, that word there, made us meet, means he's enabled you to qualify for this inheritance. What's the hope that's laid up for me at the end of this life? It's a wonderful home in eternity. It's eternal life. Eternity with my Saviour. Wonderful reward of a faithful life, hopefully. It says, what a wonderful thing. Remember to enjoy. Remember to give thanks to God for what He's done for you. This is why you push through. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. He says, not only has he prepared for you an inheritance, one which won't fade away, one which isn't going anywhere. He said, he has resettled you. That word there, uh, translated, Uh, it's used of kings who would come through uh, and they might conquer a certain city uh, and they've also conquered one over here and so that there are no uprisings or anything, what they do is they take a group of these people that lived here and they transport them over here. This is your home now. It's not your home anymore. This is your new home. You've been resettled. Uh, Now I want you to build up this one. Uh, Every aspect of your life is no longer there where it was before. It's now here. And he says, this is what God has done for us. 
He's taken us out of a world where as an unsaved person, it's controlled by uh, the devil. It's controlled by the prince and power of the air. The one who's controlling things were, were oppressed by sin and evil and, and uh, the workings of darkness. And that's what we lived under with no hope. And through salvation, God has taken us. And he said, that's not your home anymore. And he's resettled us over here in a world that's controlled by the Lord Jesus Christ. One that has hope, one that has life, one that has light. The kingdom of his dear son. He says, that's where you dwell now. The other's not your home anymore. He says, remember to enjoy that. Remember to thank God. It's what this is all about. You know, sometimes we go through our life we're trying to read our Bibles, we're trying to pray. We're doing our best effort just to get to church, do what we can. And we forget. It's an inheritance waiting for us. It's not something that everyone qualifies for. This is a special blessing. I'm wealthy. No one can remove that. No one can take away the treasure that I have up stored in heaven. I'm wealthy. I remember the inheritance. And then I remember that no longer am I living in a world without hope. I'm living in the expectant return of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and take me back to live with Him. I can live in hopeful endurance. I can be long-suffering. I can live with joy. And so that gives me purpose to go back to the Word of God. Say, all right, Lord, please teach me. I want to be filled with the knowledge of Your will because I want to walk appropriately. When I walk appropriately, that's the only way I can bear fruit. As I'm serving in an appropriate way, Lord, you're going to teach me experientially a little bit more of who you are, enabling me to go on. And Lord, I know that troubles will come. I know that trials and pressures will come. And I need to understand I'm strengthened with all might by the glorious power of God at work within me, enabling me to have patient and hopeful endurance unto the end with joy. You know, walking and spiritual growth is a joyful progress process. He says, don't forget that. And then enjoy. It's not all for nothing. There's a wonderful inheritance waiting for you. You live in the kingdom, not of darkness. To these people, not one ruled by Nero, who could have had Paul's head at any time that he was writing this. Paul understood, I, I don't live in that realm anymore. I live in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, of God's dear son. And next time we're going to then, he moves into his dear son and he explains, who is he? That's what they needed to know, but he didn't start there. He gave them this wonderful process of joyful spiritual growth. And I hope that's our desire this morning, that we would be not in a secular way, but in a spiritual way, healthy, wealthy and wise Christians who are filled with the knowledge of God's will. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us as uh, Christians, believers here this morning. Lord, all at different stages in our spiritual growth, but we would all have a desire to continue going forward. Lord, that we would do it with joy. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts. Pray that you give us greater desire to walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, endeavouring to uh, desire to please you in every way. Lord, I pray that you bless our fellowship this morning. It will be pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take our hymn books. I invite you to turn to hymn number 306. 306.